Well, welcome to a very special message this morning. Uh, This sermon kicks off a brand new series, but even more than that, this message kicks off our membership class. Okay, so you're all in membership class today. Um, and, And we need to explain that a minute because you go, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for membership class, right? But but there's been some things that uh, are, are happening in the Wesleyan Church, and, and we need to let you know about that because we're a part of the Wesleyan Church. We're not just this church that are, that's out here on our own and independent and, and totally, um, you know, just apart from everything else that's going on in God's kingdom. We are a part of a network of Wesleyan churches who all buy into the same theology, a similar vision about seeing lives, churches, and communities transformed through the hope and holiness of Jesus Christ. And uh, because we're a part of this, this bigger body, um, there's some things that you need to know about because there's some things that have happened at our general conference. Now, every year at our general, every four years actually, at our general conference, uh, the Wesleyan Network of Churches gathers, and uh, there are delegates from churches and from districts that all come together from around the world and they discuss our theological beliefs and church policies and practices. And at the 2016 General Conference, there were some changes that were made. Um, They were proposed and then uh, voted on and accepted by a majority vote. And these changes regard membership within the Wesleyan Church. They have an impact on how we do membership here at EWC. In the past, for example, we've had two-tier membership. And some of you may go, yeah, I remember that because I'm a community member, and others of you know that you have made a commitment to be a covenant member. We've had these two tiers of membership, and that's going away, okay? We're doing away with the two-tier membership. Now, from here on out, there's going to be a single tier of membership, and we are looking for members who will be healthy spiritually, active in the church, and growing in their relationship with Christ. All of us, of course, as Christ followers, are called to live lives that are worthy of the name Christian, right? We have a responsibility to bear that name uh, in a way that honors Christ. Uh, You know, the Bible clearly teaches, however, that leaders in the church are held to a higher standard. They, because they have spiritual influence over others in the church, they're held to a higher standard of conduct. I, I remember hearing a, a story, a legend, about Alexander the Great, who conquered the, the known world at, during his time. And uh, he was a, a brilliant military strategist and, and uh, you know, just this powerful conqueror. And, and one day... Uh, a soldier was brought to him who had uh, brought to him, I guess, with charges of dereliction of duty. He had fallen asleep while on duty. And one of the punishments for that was death. In fact, a lot of times a commanding officer, if they found a, a soldier asleep on duty, would douse them with kerosene and just light him on fire. That would be the end of it. All right? This, uh, this soldier was brought to Alexander and uh, for dereliction of duty, and brought before him. And for some reason, there was something about this young soldier that, that Alexander, instead of just killing him on the spot, started asking him questions. He said, son, do you know what the punishment for falling asleep on duty is? He says, yes, sir, it's death. He said, soldier, what's your name? And the man replied, Alexander. And suddenly, Alexander the Great's attitude changed. He said, what? What is your name? Alexander, sir. What is your name, soldier? It's Alexander. And he looked at the soldier, he threw his finger in his face, and he says, soldier, change your name. Or change your conduct. See, we have a responsibility, don't we? To bear the name Christian in a way that honors Christ. You're going to call yourself a Christian. We need to live 
at a level. And that's especially true for leaders. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Do not be conformed to the, any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Spiritual transformation and growth in Christ is a process, isn't it? I mean, all of us, if we look at our lives, we, we, I would hope, I hope you would hope, that when you look back on your life like last year, that somehow you've moved along a continuum of growth since that time, right? You're not still stuck in the same place, I hope, right? Because growth in Christ is a process. We are to become more and more and more like Christ every day. We're going to grow in his, in his likeness. We're supposed to be taking next steps on our spiritual journey. And anyone serving in a leadership role at EWC is expected to have already grown and matured spiritually to a point that their life and their conduct is an example to others who look to them for spiritual guidance and direction. Makes sense, right? Now, we have only four basic requirements for membership. And the first is this, that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. You are a follower of Jesus Christ. This means that not only have you accepted him as, as your Savior, but that with the help of the Holy Spirit, you are striving to live for him. 1 John 2.6 says, Whoever claims to live in Christ must walk as Jesus did. We're to walk in his steps. The second is baptism. The Bible teaches that baptism is a public declaration to the world that we have been buried with Christ and raised to new life in Him. And for that reason, our church does immersion. We dunk you. We want to make sure that you are wet when you come up out of the water. We don't sprinkle. We dunk. And we have a great time doing it too because it's just like the white balloons. It's a big celebration that day. Baptism is not a somber thing. It's a celebration. And so when people come up out of the water, we cheer. Because there's new life in Christ that we're celebrating. The third requirement is to receive uh, and accept our statements of faith. We think it's important. I, I, I think this makes sense. You tell me. We think it's important for you to know what we believe before you decide to become a member. That makes sense? A few years ago, there was a reality show called Snake Salvation. Anybody see that show? Nobody saw that? (laughs) It's probably one of the reasons it's not on the air anymore. (laughs) I'm the only one that watched, you know. Um, I found it kind of interesting. Uh, Snake Salvation was about a group of churches in Tennessee that handle poisonous snakes as part of their worship service. And it didn't last long because... (laughs) Not because you didn't watch. It really isn't because of that at all. It didn't last long because the pastor and the star of the show, Jamie Coots, died. Of a snake bite. Okay? So I, I don't really care if you, you know, want to handle snakes or not. I just want you to know that if you're looking for that kind of a church, we ain't it. Okay? I hate snakes. Okay, so we are not a snake-handling church. It's important for you to know what we believe if you're going to join our church. Fourth is a commitment to the vision and mission of EWC. At EWC, we believe that God has called us to reach our community for Christ by becoming a healthy, reproducing, multi-ethnic ministry. The question that prospective members need to ask themselves is, does my heart resonate with that? Is that what I want too? Do I want to be a part of that? Does my heart resonate with the vision and the mission of EWC? Am I ready to live out that vision and to do my part to reach our community with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because that's what we're all about. When I first came to EWC, I discovered that we had people on our membership list that hadn't attended here in years. Some had moved out of the state. Others were attending other churches, and we even had a few that died and hadn't bothered to tell us. (laughs) Rather rude, I thought. You see, it used to be that if you were a member, if you became a member, it was pretty much for life, and then some, evidently. 
Now with this new change, instead of being a member for life, you will have an annual opportunity to reaffirm your desire to be a member here at EWC. Around the beginning of the year, we'll ask you, are you still on board? Do you still buy into us? Do you still agree to live out the mission and the vision of the church? Do you, do you buy into Wesleyan theology? And then you'll have the opportunity to publicly reaffirm your membership. And we'll do our best to contact every, every member that's on our list and encourage them to reaffirm their membership commitment. If we're unable to reach you after multiple tries and don't hear back from you, then we'll assume that you are voluntarily uh, withdrawing your membership. Now, for those of you that are new to EWC, we typically offer a membership class and invite you to attend. And after attending the class, prospective members are then uh, invited to join. This time, however, since these changes affect all of us and require even our current members to reaffirm their membership commitment, we thought it would be cool to just kind of consider this series our membership class. So here's the deal. If you all will just attend for the next four Sundays, I mean not just attend for the next four Sundays, we want you here after that too, but if you'll attend the next four Sundays and make a commitment to do that, um, or if you can't be here and you'll watch the messages online, then you'll have uh, the information that you need about who we are and what we're all about to make an informed decision about joining the church. And on Sunday, March 26th, okay, write that down, March 26th, Sunday morning, you can choose to become a member or reaffirm your membership commitment on that day. Now, <clears throat> some of you know that over the course of the last year, I've dropped 25 pounds. Huh? Right? And, and, and many of you have been really encouraging about that for me and, and telling me how good I look, and, and that's been motivating. And, and so I, you know, I sort of keep trying, and, and I was feeling pretty good about myself until I went to the doctor who took one look at me and said, you need to lose 40 pounds. I said, dude, you're fat too. What are you telling me about you know, don't judge me. No, I didn't say that. But I thought, you know, you could have at least acknowledged that I lost 25 pounds, right? I mean, but no, you know, just straight out, you got to lose 40 pounds, dude. So I'm back at the gym and I'm working out and I'm counting calories and I'm miserable. But I noticed on the wall of my gym, Written in great big bold letters are the words, you belong. You belong. Now, gyms can be intimidating, can't they? Right? I, I mean, like if you're 30 or 40 pounds overweight, it's easy to wonder, what am I doing here? Right? It's, it's hard to feel like you belong when you're on a machine and you're huffing and puffing, body parts are jiggling, right? And, 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 and the guy next to you on the machine... He's got six-pack abs, right? Not an ounce of fat on him, and he's ripped and arms of steel, and he's not even breaking a sweat. Now, that can be intimidating. But the truth is, for all those reasons and more, the gym is precisely the place where you do belong, right? Gyms aren't just for people who are in shape. They are for people who need to change the shape they're in. Round is a shape, right? <laughs> but I'd like to change that shape. As miserable as it is sometimes. Sometimes people look at the church like they look at the gym. They think church is for people who are spiritually in shape and have their lives together. And the truth is that church is for people who need to get in better shape, and they know it. The church is the place that no matter what kind of spiritual shape you're in, when you walk through the doors, you can belong. In fact, I, I, I didn't write this in here, but I just thought of a, a quote that I heard one time that, that was all about, it basically said, the church exists precisely for the people who do not yet belong to it. Right? Most people think that the church is a building. 
But the church is more than a building. It's people. It's the gathering and mobilizing of God's people. And EWC is not just a building on the corner of Hershberger and Florist. We are the church. You are the church. In fact, turn to the person next to you and say, you're the church. You see, everywhere in our world today, people are hungering for fellowship and community and a sense of belonging and a sense of family. A recent Barna, George Barna report, now he's the guy that keeps his thumb on the pulse of what's happening in the church in America. And a recent report indicates that the United States is statistically the loneliest country in the world. Nearly 40% of Americans report that they are lonely. And the research shows that more people identify with characters on television than with their neighbors. That's sad. I heard about an older woman who waited in line at a post office to buy stamps. And one day she got to the counter and the postal worker said, "Um, you know, you don't have to wait in line to buy stamps. You can buy them in books of 20 from the machine right over there. She said, I know. But the machine doesn't ask me about my arthritis. Hmm? I was thinking about this ongoing search for friendships and family connections. And so... I, I just did something on the spur of the moment that was kind of funny. I have an iPhone. If you have an iPhone, you're familiar with Siri, right? And you can ask Siri questions. And So I said, Siri, will you be my friend? When I say that out loud, it sounds kind of pathetic, doesn't it? <laughs> Seriously, I have friends. I, uh, I, I do. I, I, I do. Um... <laughs> um but uh, it was her, her response was kind of disconcerting because after, after I asked the question, there was this really long pause as if, as if she was thinking, right? Um, like she wasn't sure whether or not she really wanted to be my friend. My, uh, I waited and, and uh, she finally said, Oh, that's nice. I would like to be your friend. <laughs> I'm still not so sure that she was being sincere, though. I think maybe she was kind of patronizing me or something. Um, The Bible uses a lot of uh, metaphors to describe the church, but most often Christians are called family, right? The children of God, the household of God, the brothers and sisters in Christ. In Ephesians 2, Paul wrote these words, But now in Christ, Jesus... You who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Some of you are here today, and and, and when you came in, you went right to your seat. You know what I'm talking about? Like you have a place, every, every, I know who's here on Sundays because you all sit in the same place. Oh, oh yeah, they're missing today. There's an empty seat there, right? I know, I know who that is uh, because you're there every week. And, and so some of you come in and you, you sit on the left side over here, stage left, and you're there like every week, not, not just today, but every single Sunday, right? If, and, and some of you, like, I don't know if you'd actually do this or not, but you'd be tempted to ask somebody to move if they were sitting in your seat. I, I just know you would do that, um, or at least feel like you should do that, um, because it would take like an act of God to move you to this side of the church, right? Uh, you're just left side of the church people, you know, it's just the way it is, and, and you guys are laughing at them, but you're the same way, Right? <laughs> And, and you come over on the, on the right side, stage right, and, and you sit on this side of the church. And, and it's, it's like you think that if you moved over here, the earth would tilt off its axis, you know. And it really wouldn't happen that way. And then there's some of you that always sit in the back, right back here, okay. You know who you are, right. You like the back row. I uh, affectionately call that sinner's row, by the way. Um, <laughs> 
but you like the back row. And if you come in and that back row is filled, you go out in the, in, the, in the lobby here and you grab chairs and you set it around the stairs just so that you can have a back row. Right? Uh, but for some of you, being here just feels right. You know? You sit where you sit because it feels right. You come to this church because it feels right. It just feels like you belong here. And you're as comfortable here as you are in your favorite old jeans and sweatshirt. On the other hand, you might be new here today, and, and you're thinking, man, these people are a little scary. <laughs> I understand they scared me too at first. <laughs> Maybe you've only been coming for a few weeks, and you're still just a little uncomfortable, a little unsure, a little intimidated, and, and not feeling like you belong here yet. Let me go back to verse 19. In Ephesians, where, where Paul writes, You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Paul is reminding us that we're no longer strangers or foreigners in a land where we don't belong. We don't need a passport or a visa or a green card. We have been brought near to God by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. And in him, we're family. We're family. We don't, we don't have to feel out of place because we belong. When we encounter Jesus and enter into a personal relationship with him, the Bible says that we have the right to be called children of God. He becomes our heavenly father. In the Greek, household meant the immediate family. It meant that you were blood relation. You were no longer an outsider, a stranger, or an intruder. We are the household of God because of the cross. And when we proclaim Jesus Christ as our Savior, we get the promise of eternal life. We get a new life that begins here and now. We get our sins forgiven and our slates wiped clean. We get amazing grace and mercies that are new every morning. We get a peace that passes understanding. We get a new purpose and fulfillment in life. We get the assurance that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. And we also get to be a part of a community of believers, members of God's household and part of his family. The Jerusalem church in the book of Acts was a mosaic of believers from varied backgrounds with distinct personalities and, and sometimes conflicting opinions, right? They didn't always agree, but they, they, they found, out, found out a way to work together. And because they did, lives were transformed and history was changed. And as we live, love, and learn to follow their example, we too can change the world. But the early church didn't impact the world simply because they gathered together for a service once a week. People gather at Walmart, but there's not a whole lot of world changing going on at your average Walmart, is there? The early church impacted the world not because they gathered together, but because they were on mission together. If we're going to change the world, it's going to take more than just showing up on Sunday. It's going to take being on mission together. We need to be committed to declaring and sharing and living our new life in Christ. And one of the ways that we declare our commitment is through church membership. It's our declaration that we have found a spiritual home and a spiritual family. And we are committing ourselves to the mission and the vision of the local church. This week was a great week uh, for me. I got several texts and emails. And one of the emails, and sometimes those aren't good, by the way, uh, but this week it was. And, and I got this email from someone that I've never met. And here's what she said. She said, I wanted to drop you a note to say thank you. You don't know me personally, but I want to thank you and your staff for your service, commitment, and love 
for this community. It's making an impact. Your work is bearing fruit. So thank you. Be encouraged. You are making a difference. Keep it up. Man, I could live for weeks off of that, right? And it's calorie-free, too. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that fires me up and keeps me going. I am so pumped and so blessed to be a part of this church, part of a church that's making a difference in the world for Christ. I believe that's the kind of church we all want to be a part of, isn't it? Now, the Bible doesn't address the concept of formal church membership directly, but there are several passages that strongly imply its existence, even in the early church. You know, some people say that numbers don't matter when it comes to the church, but apparently numbers mattered enough that the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, that 3,000 were added to the church in a single day. It mattered enough that someone kept record of those who were being saved, baptized, and joining the church. Numbers do matter. That's why we know that there were 12 disciples. You know, it's why we know that there were 120 gathered in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. That's why we know that Jesus fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Because numbers matter. And membership matters. Because it's a way of organizing the numbers. It's a way of organizing a healthy, growing, active church. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 40 says, Let everything in the church be done in a decent and orderly manner. Membership is a good way of determining who has the right to vote, for example, on important church decisions, who's eligible to serve in leadership positions in the church, but the importance of membership goes way beyond just tracking numbers and staying organized. Membership matters because joining the church, and this may be the, the, the greatest reason for it, membership matters because joining the church makes a powerful statement in a low-commitment culture. We live in a consumer culture where everything is about me. It's about what I want. And when my needs aren't met, well, then it's just time to move on to the next product or the next job or the next spouse. Membership is a powerful, visible expression of your commitment to Christ and his people. It's a counterculture statement that says, I am committed first to Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord and then to the people of this church. And you know what else? They're committed to me. Many people just prefer to date the church, right? They just sort of want this, this dating relationship with the church. They like to have her around for special occasions. They get dressed up with, for her once in a while, right? They show up at, at her door when they feel lonely. They keep her number in their contacts so they can call if they need her. But when, we're, when we join the church, we're saying, I'm all done with dating. Let's get married. It's a more permanent relationship. Membership matters because joining the church makes a powerful statement in a low commitment culture. Membership is important, secondly, because we can be overly independent. You know, it's one of the best and worst things about being Americans. We are free spirits and independent thinkers, and, and we, we tend to get these ideas, and we just run with them, right? And we rarely stop to see if anyone is running with us, or if they are, 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 are they running in the same direction, right? But there's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christians in the Bible. We are taught that we are better together. Did you know that there are 59 one another commandments in the New Testament. You know what I'm talking about, right? Love one another and such, right? 59 of those. We are told over and over again, love one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, live at peace with one another, bear one another's burdens. burdens. And, and, and one of the things that you can't do alone is one another commands, right? 
I mean, you, you have to be a part of a body in order to, to fulfill those commandments. There's no other way to do it. Membership is a formal way of saying, I am part of something that's bigger than myself. It's not just me and Jesus and Jesus and me. I am part of a body. Third, membership helps keep us accountable for growing in our faith and becoming the person that God is calling us to be. And this accountability, it's twofold. Hebrews 13, 7 addresses both members and pastors. Members are, are, are said to, um, to have confidence, told to have confidence in their leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. When we join a church, we are saying, this is where I want to grow spiritually. And we are asking our leaders to love us, encourage us, guide us, develop us, and even call us out when necessary. But this verse also teaches that God will hold me as your pastor accountable for how well I serve, love, teach, care for, correct, and disciple you as members. Now, I get it. We, we all tend to cringe, right, at words like accountability and discipline, right? The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, that no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. I can remember very painful discipline growing up when my dad decided that I needed to have uh, a whipping, right? But the Bible also says in that same verse, later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Discipline and accountability help us reach our full potential in Christ. Discipline in the church is not punishment. Discipline in the church is saying to you, I love you enough to help you move forward in your relationship with Christ. Church membership is a way of identifying oneself with a local body of believers and making oneself accountable to spiritual leadership so that we can reach our full potential in Jesus Christ. You know, from the moment that you walk through the doors for the very first time of EWC, we embrace you as family. I love seeing new folks come through our doors. I love having you here. I love getting to know you. I've got two dinners set up this week that I'm going to meet with some of you that are new. I'm, I'm really excited about that. We embrace you as family from the very first time that you walk through the doors. Membership is a way for you to embrace us back. And to say that this is the church that I want to be part of and to officially declare I'm all in. I'm all in. So if you're not a member yet of EWC, this is a great time for you to consider joining the church. And I hope that over the next few weeks that you'll be here, and then on March 26th, that, that you'll stand together with others who want to officially make EWC their church home and their spiritual family. And if you're already a member of EWC, I hope that you'll be here for the entire series, and then on March 26th, you will stand to reaffirm your membership along with those that are joining EWC for the first time. It's going to be a great celebration. We've got some really exciting things planned, and if you miss the next few weeks, you're going to miss a lot. So please, do whatever you can to be here. Make Sunday morning a priority. Now, speaking of celebration, we're going to close today a little differently than we normally do. You know why we have the balloons up here. It's White Balloon Sunday. Ten people cross the line of faith. And some of you, I, I think sometimes when it's kids, we show the picture up there and they're kids. And sometimes when, when we do that and they're kids, we think, oh, well, that's nice. You know, but we'd rather see adults cross the line of faith, right? Somehow in our minds, it tends to mean more when it's an adult that makes that decision. I mean, how much can a kid know about accepting Christ as their Savior? Let me tell you something. I was four years old. When I crossed the line of faith. I remember exactly where it was. It was a vacation Bible school. And I knelt at an altar and prayed to accept Jesus as my Savior. When you pray to receive Christ as a kid, you, in fact, the Bible tells us, doesn't it? That unless we come with the faith of a child, 
you know, I, we're in trouble. We, we got to have the faith of a child, even if we're adults. D.L. Moody one time um, was asked how many people came to know Christ at, at, at one of his evangelistic uh, services, and, and he said three. And, uh, or I'm sorry, he said two and a half. You know, two and a half, and the guy said, what do you mean by that? He said, do you mean like two adults and a kid? And he said, no, two kids and an adult. The reason being is that the kid has their whole life, right, to serve the Lord. That's pretty exciting when you think about it that way, isn't it? Ten young kids gave their heart to the Lord this week who have their entire lives ahead of them to serve the Lord. And that's exciting. And that's worth celebrating. The Bible says that angels in heaven celebrate when even one crosses the line of faith. So here's what we're going to do uh, today to close this out, and we'll, we'll, we'll do this outside. We're going to go release these balloons. And um, we're going to walk outside in the front. The whole world will wonder what we're doing as they're driving by. That's okay. Um, but we're going to release those balloons. We're going to cheer again, and then I'll close in prayer out there, okay? So let's move out to the, to the front of the church. Mm.